Detective Incorporated presents Alaska bear guide and professional bow hunter. Wade Nolan, wildlife photographer and Alaska biologist. And Gary Alt, black bear researcher. in silently with the prowess of a cat.
have imagined this moment a thousand times. Now he's there, not 15 yards away. Will he be the first bear of the hunt, or the only? He's big, but how big? Long ago, you decided to take only a perfect shot, but this is almost perfect. Your heart is pounding. him up and wait. But already, it's been worth it. Harvesting a trophy black bear over bait is no less challenging than catching a trophy rainbow trout on bait or lures. Actually, very few forms of hunting include as much work, personal effort, know-how, and planning as bow hunting baits for black bear. At least seven days of scouting, setup, and maintenance are expended for each day you hunt. A few attractive benefits of bow hunting over bait include an opportunity to selectively harvest only large boars, an extremely high percentage of one-shot kills, the goal of all bow hunters. A high rate of success for those willing to expend the time and energy to set up and maintain a bait. And the unique thrill of sitting alone in a tree above an unalarmed black bear. A full 72% of the states, and much of Canada, offer a hunting season for black bear in which baiting is used as a game management technique. Check your local regulations and good hunting. Across the last 15 years, Gary Ault has located, tranquilized, and handled over 2,000 black bears, more than anyone else in the world. Gary has crawled into hundreds of active winter dens armed only with a flashlight and a tranquilizing dart. Yet neither he nor any member of his research team have ever been injured. As Gary readily admits, his work is not dull. He's been charged by over 100 bears, run over by a handful, and once stood on by a bear. His year-round research efforts have been pivotal in the success of game management efforts involving black bear in Pennsylvania and across North America. His findings have proven that black bears can live and thrive in populated areas and that aggression towards humans is extremely rare with eastern black bears. As a result of his unparalleled field experience with North America's most common bear, Gary is a high-demand lecturer. When Gary's not chasing bears, he's bow-hunting eastern whitetails. Some have estimated that there are over 500,000 black bears in North America. Uh, most of them occur in the mountainous, forested regions like here in Alaska and throughout uh, the Rocky and Appalachian Mountains. They exist in all the Canadian provinces in about 40 of the lower 48 states. The black bear is found over a greater area in North America than any of the other species of bears, but uh, even though it lives in this wide area, there are some things that remain consistent. And one of those things is that black bears really desire dense, uh, thick cover. Here in Alaska, the willow and uh, alder river bottoms are preferred by black bears. If you're in Maine, the rejuvenating coniferous forest where you have this dense underbrush is preferred. In the eastern United States, in areas like Pennsylvania, uh, the rhododendron and blueberry swamps. In the Carolinas, it's the river bays and so on. But uh, you get out around Arizona, it's chaparral. So it isn't the species of uh, vegetation that is so important as it is the escape cover. These animals, these black bears, are looking for a place to get away from harassment. 
to get away from people, to get away from dogs. And so no matter where you live in North America or where you hunt, I think that principle is an important one to keep in mind if you're in pursuit uh, of the black bear. Shorelines concentrate bear movements. Our bait station is located on the left side of the channel. This is the bear Ralph is waiting for. It's a good bear with a beautiful unrubbed coat. The liquid barrel bait doesn't hold him in position long enough for a shot. The next day, a different bear came in first. Yesterday's bear is back, and the additional offering of sweets is holding him in position. He hears or smells the first bear who's still circling the area. From this angle, Ralph must concentrate on both the arrow entry and exit points, then pick a spot. The secondary bait source held the bear in position long enough for a shot. The site had multiple bears using it. The bear was watching for other bears and never saw Ralph. He even exits under the stand after the shot. Ralph took this shot because he knew it would result in a clean kill. Total penetration angling forward through the heart. The bear went down in 13 seconds. Locating an unhunted area will enhance your success. This site was reached by jet boat. Most established working baits have a resident bear. He's the bear that most frequently visits the bait and often camps out nearby. The resident bear isn't always the largest bear using a bait. These bears will move downwind when you approach the station and are usually the first bears to appear once you're in the stand. It's impossible to totally eliminate man scent at a bait station. Because of this, we employ scent conditioning. It's possible to condition bears to expect the hunter's scent at a bait station. When maintaining it, touch nearby trees to ensure that the bears will have to endure a measure of your man scent in order to utilize the bait. Bears will eventually succumb to the hunger drive and tolerate some man scent. The day you hunt, do everything you can to minimize your scent. Bears can detect and gauge the potency of man scent. They can tell if you passed by three days ago or 30 minutes ago, and they react accordingly. This potency can be masked or camouflaged by using a powerful competitive scent. Aromatic flavorings such as peppermint, butter, or anise are sprayed near the bait each time the site is maintained. Spray the area generously when you enter to hunt. A potent competitive scent also works as a silent downwind dinner bell. 
Station pre-scouting consists of searching out a prime location to establish a bait station. There are several things to look for. After choosing an area with a stable black bear population, begin scouting adjacent to waterways, streams, rivers, and lakes channel bear movement. Look for natural food sources, like berry patches or fish spawning streams. Valleys with predictable wind patterns are especially good for dispersing scent, which will initially bring in the bears. Watch for scat and tracks. Tracks measuring over five inches in width are made by large bears. During your scouting, you might run into some trees that look like these. This one here has been bitten and scratched by black bears, as is that one there. We recognize these trees as boundary trees or scratch trees. While we were scouting, we located these two trees and it helped us to choose a bait site, which is about 100 yards down over the hill here. Once you've located some promising signs, look for a site that offers dense cover adjacent to a small clearing. Running water nearby is a plus. Your stand should be placed a maximum of 20 yards downwind of the bait. Time and energy spent pre-scouting pays off. Here in North America, bow hunting uh, could kind of be broken into two major categories, I think. One uh, that most of us are familiar with are uh, hunting white-tailed deer and elk, for example, where we capitalize on the sex drive, we hunt them during the rut, we imitate the sounds of clashing antlers or uh, the sounds of potential mates or rivals to entice the male in for a shot. When hunting black bears, however, it's, it's quite different. Uh, black bears uh, follow their nose around quite a bit and uh, their stomach is really the key to success there. And you've got to depend on food or whether it be supplied by you in the forms of bait in areas where they're legal or whether you're depending upon natural, re natural foods which are available already. Uh, in areas where baiting is not legal, uh, you may look for berry patches, blueberry patches, for example. Uh, old abandoned apple orchards are effective. Uh, in some areas, you may actually be able to help out farmers that are having corn damage problems. And you'll find trails coming to these food sources, which uh, could give you a good chance of success. But the main thing I think that you need to keep in your mind is that uh, with the bear, it's his stomach and it's his food requirements that you want to be thinking about. There are five common bait station types. The vertical barrel is especially good for liquid or grain baits. The cubby bait is effective and easy to construct, but subject to rain damage. The covered pit is good for dry regions when keeping baits moist is a problem. Pits are poor for scent dispersal. Horizontal barrels may be the best all-around choice. They're especially good for positioning a bear. Hanging baits are only recommended for startup when scent dispersal is your primary goal. Let's talk for a minute about the bait types to use when you set up your bait station. The first thing we do, well in advance of the season, is to mix up a good call bait. The only way a black bear is going to find your bait station is by smell. A black bear can smell a good call bait a half a mile downwind. A call bait is the foulest smelling concoction you can mix up. Anything that rots is a prime candidate for your call bait. Fish and meat scraps work best. You might want to stuff an old roadkill groundhog in your bucket to spice it up, then seal it and set it in the backyard in the sun for a couple of weeks. Then when the neighbors start calling, it's ready. Another effective call technique used during setup is the grease burn. Smoke is produced by burning discarded French fryer grease in a metal bucket. 
Placing the bucket in shallow water or in a swamp will limit fire hazard. Begin by building a small fire directly on top of the grease in the bucket. Once started, the sticks will wick up and burn the grease. The smoke smells like dinner time at a greasy spoon restaurant and will grab the attention of all downwind bears. The attracting odor will persist for days. And be certain the grease is completely extinguished before you leave. Everyone has their own favorite bait. I believe that beef soot is the best all-around bear bait. It comes in small chunks, so the bears have to stay at the bait pile and eat it. Rain doesn't bother it, and the bears love it. And it doesn't get infested with maggots. I think beef soot is a top choice. When choosing and placing baits, keep three criteria in mind. Variety, high volume, and freshness. Sweets, donuts, and pastries is another top choice for bait. In fact, sweets may be the bear's first choice. We've always had good luck when baiting with sweets. Fresh fish and meat scraps are another good choice when placed at an active bait. However, make sure your bears are coming in daily, otherwise flies and maggots will ruin your bait before the bears get to it. We do have another bait. We call it our sourdough mash. You might want to use it too. Here's how we make it. In a clean 55 gallon drum, mix two five gallon buckets of barley, five gallons of water, and 10 pounds of sugar. Oh, this is gonna be good. Wait seven days for fermentation. The bears love it. Scent hunting for black bears can be very effective. These aromatic flavorings are all available in grocery stores. It's often argued that one scent works better than another. We took the question to the bears. Unlike edible bait hits, scent hits are typically brief. At this site, the river makes enough cover noise that Ralph can talk into a microphone only 14 yards away from the bears. At least four different bears are using this site. The resident bear entered the clearing before Ralph could attach his safety belt and sit down. Ralph is shooting a practice arrow at a leaf near the bait. I think this is that big one that we've been waiting for. So, if he gets in a good spot here, I'll get him. Before Ralph will take the shot, the bear must be broadside and the right leg forward. The opportunity never comes. Let me show you how I determine the spot where I shoot the bear and 
Let me show you why I prefer the broadside shot. I take and draw a line in the center of the bear. This gives me a point from which forward I can shoot. I draw another line, center of the bear, which gives me the up and down, and then I get an aiming spot. I take four inches from this line forward, gives me a spot right here where I want to shoot this bear. Center line, four inches in the center. This makes my X. Here's my, here's my aiming spot. Center of the bear, four inches in front of the center this way. There's my aiming point. Let me show you why I prefer this broadside shot. The lungs extend like this. This is the lung area of this bear. Right here, covering my hand, is the heart. Right there on this bear is the heart. If you shoot him right there in that spot, this bear will live 10 seconds. Anywhere in this lung area shot, this bear will live 60 seconds. This is perfect for getting a one-shot kill on a bear. The only spot you want to watch on this is right here, where my hand is. This is the shoulder area. This is the scapula. If you shoot a bear right here, it will stick in this shoulder. It will not penetrate. It will not kill it. The bear's leg bones come down here. An arrow in here will break a leg bone and penetrate and kill the bear. Don't shoot him right here. Here's the aiming spot. Don't shoot him right here. Anywhere else right in this area, in front of this center line, four inches up or down, will kill this bear in 60 seconds. This is the preferred broadside shot. This is a model of a black bear. The back side shows internal anatomy. We're going to use this model to help you visualize good shot placement. Like we did the big bear, let's divide this model into four quadrants. Center line, front and back, center line here, top and bottom. Then let's pick our spot four inches in front of this center line, which would be about here. Let's push this pin through here, depicting our arrow spot, and see where it goes into the bear. As you can see, the arrow has come out right through the top of the heart and through both lungs. This is a perfect shot placement. With this shot, this bear would live 10 seconds. I think this one looks like a pretty good bear. He's got a pretty big head, pretty big everything. He got more, a little better coat than the others.
case, the practice, scouting, and waiting paid off. The shot passed through the heart. The bear traveled only 20 yards. Well, congratulations on that, guy. Yeah, that was great. That was a good shot. That's a good shot, yeah. Yeah. Was... 15 yards, maybe. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah, I, I thought he was going to be run off there. He looked like he was going to be pretty spooky. Big broadhead. Yeah, oh, That's Andy thick. Thunderhead did the trick on Did he see guy. you when he first stepped in? Yeah, I don't know. I think um, he was kind of looking around there, but I think it was those other bears over there on the side that did him, you know. I think he's listening for them, but... Uh, I saw him kind of stop for a second and look, you know. Yeah, so... Good deal. Good thing he didn't run off then. <laughs> but, well, uh, get your knife ready. I'll get the freezer wrapped up. All right, that's on. Man, that ought to be good eating. Let's take a look back at that shot and then see what we can learn. One of the most important factors working to our benefit here was the cover noise provided by the creek. It allowed me to move around in my tree stand and to pull my bow and the bear never heard me. Another very important factor was the cubby. It positioned the bear perfectly for the shot. As you notice, when the bear was broadside to me, I was able to pull my bow and make a perfect one-shot kill. The cubby allowed me to do that. Our scouting paid off. We knew which trail the bear had probably come in on, and when he did, we were ready. After the shot, when he left on this trail behind me, we'd already scouted that trail. We knew where it led, and so the bear was easy to find. In the past 14 years, I've had hundreds and hundreds of opportunities to observe bears at close range and to try and appraise their ability to detect us using their senses. The black bear's ability to hear, I think, is, is quite good. We can uh, determine that they uh, can hear noises probably comparable to humans, what we can hear. Uh, I do believe, though, that the sense of sight is much better in bears than most people think. Perhaps not in distinguishing objects that are still, but uh, certainly in determining movement. And I think uh, we know that black bears can pick up movement several hundred yards away without any trouble at all. So I think there are a lot of people out there who think that black bears would be legally blind if they were humans, and I can tell you that's not true. And if you're out there in bear country and you don't want to be detected, you better not move very much once you're in position. The sense of smell in black bears is legendary. Uh, of all the senses, that's the one he uses most. Uh, that's pro without question his most important sense. It's a bit of a paradox that we depend upon the black bear's sense of smell to uh, find our baits and to bring him in, and yet it's that same sense of smell that uh, allows him to detect us. And so that's why it's so critically important that you uh, keep track of where your scent is and take time to plan where you put your stand so that uh, you can bring the bear in and let him detect the scent of your bait, but not uh, your own scent. An understanding of those principles, I think, will uh, greatly increase your chances of success if you're out there hunting. It's very important that you scout your bait station area after the bears are hitting the bait. The bears will develop a network of access trails which radiate out from the station like spokes of a wheel. Some will be more defined than others. Most often, a shot bear will exit and die on one of these trails. Mentally noting access trail locations will aid greatly in quick and sure recovery of your bear. Setting up a track pad of soft dirt or sand near your bait station or on an access trail will help you determine the relative size of your bears. Another good active sight scouting technique involves the use of a timer. Last night before we left, we hooked up our trail timer and we run the string right across in front of the barrel there and it's been tripped, so let's open it up and see what time he was here. Eleven oh three. He must have come in about an hour after we left the bait. Learning all you can about your bait station once it becomes active will improve your chances of success. One of the best locations for finding concentrations of black bears is along the shoreline of large lakes. We knowingly located this station less than 100 yards from an island that housed a very active herring gull rookery. 
Aside from the ever-present fishy smell of the rookery, the noisy gulls set up a constant chatter that filled the otherwise silent forest. Giant cottonwood trees near the shore form a natural cubby at this site. The hanging bait is filled with doughnuts. A few fresh salmon heads are scattered beneath and covered with brush. This is the third evening the site has been hunted. The largest bear using the station is extremely wary and alert. One practice shot and the wait begins. This is bow hunting, close range, one-on-one, -on -one, and very personal. Your muscles transferring energy to a cast arrow. For a short time, you are within the security circle of a magnificent wild bear. Very likely you're closer to this bear than any human has ever been. He has razor sharp canines and claws. You, a razor sharp broadhead. His senses are honed to a fine edge and working at a peak to detect danger. Your heart pounds, but that's why you're here. After a short wait, we moved in. The string on the game tracker led 50 yards. The bear lay 20 yards further. What a guy, huh? <laughs> Not too shabby. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> All right. Looking back at this shot, we see that the bear was uneasy at the bait and didn't present a shot until his second time in. The vertical bark pattern of the tree bark camo hid the hunter even though the distance was under 15 yards. The surgically sharp 160 Thunderhead stopped this bear within 70 yards. Bow hunters always talk about using razor sharp broadheads, but do you really know why? Arrows kill by hemorrhaging. The fastest kills are produced by cutting arteries. However, arteries are some of the toughest tissues to cut. They are elastic and resilient. A dull broadhead will oftentimes push aside an artery rather than cut it. Here I've got a practice broadhead. It's been shot a few times. Still feels sharp, but it's lost its edge. Here I've got a piece of surgical tubing. It's tough and elastic, much like an artery. For the sake of this demonstration, we've stretched some of the same tubing across the hole in this board. This tubing represents arteries. Watch what happens when I push this dull broadhead through the tubing. As you can see, the dull broadhead pushes the tough elastic tubing out of the way without cutting it. Now let's repeat that same process using razor sharp broadheads right out of the quiver. Now that's how sharp your broadhead should be. Razor blade cuts bleed freely because they offer a smooth surface which the 
clots can't adhere to. These cuts also clot slowly because they release so few clotting agents into the surrounding tissue. On the other hand, ragged tearing cuts, such as those produced by this dull broadhead, clot quickly, increasing the chances that your bear could escape. We owe it to the bears to use razor sharp broadheads. A salmon spawning stream flows out of this lake. A few hundred yards downstream, a natural crossing log was spotted during scouting. Close examination revealed claw marks made by black bears. A bait station was set up in a small clearing adjacent to the crossing log. It was a prime opportunity to attract multiple bears. The system I'm going to tell you about right now will fire up a bait faster than any way I know. Ralph and I use it every time we set up a new bait. Right here in your track pad, we're going to set up what we call a grease pad. This fires up a bait so fast, and when you get one bear hitting the bait, within a few days, you'll have multiple bears here. You might have four or five bears. What we're going to do is we take and we clean the area up just like we have right here. We take some restaurant grease. This is just French fire grease. It might be Dunkin' Donut grease or chicken grease or whatever the case. And we're going to take and we're going to spill it all over this pad. And then I'm going to take this grease and I'm going to stir it all up with a stick. Kind of making a big mud pie here is what we're doing out of grease. Now let me tell you a theory behind this. Here's what's going to happen. Right now we've got one bear hitting this bait. Tonight he's going to come in, he's going to hit the bait again, he's going to be standing right in this grease pad. He's going to leave, he's going to walk away, he's going to go to places other bears go. He's going to be going to berry patches, maybe a spawning stream we don't know about, digging roots on a hillside. He's going to be where other bears go though. Tomorrow when he walks back here, he's going to be laying down a trail. We call it the good news trail because everywhere he goes, once he's hitting our bait, he's laying down a scent trail out of this grease that leads directly back to this bait. It fires up a bait faster than any system I can tell you about, and it absolutely works. Okay, here we are back at our grease uh, pad that we laid down yesterday. As you can see, our bear's been in here. He's got tracks all over here. There's a good one there, and here's a good one here. Looks like our uh, good news trail is working on all four feet. The presence of more than one bear at or near a bait station is a big plus for the hunter. Unlike whitetails, where multiple eyes and noses are a liability, black bears tend to become engrossed in the presence of a second or third bear, making them less likely to detect a hunter at stand level. Actually, a hunter can move more freely and with less chance of detection when two bears are at the bait than he can with only one. Some bears will circle and investigate a bait for an hour or more before venturing in. Even the residual scent of a bear that has recently left the station will fully gather the next bear's attention as he approaches. Closely watch the actions and body language of each bear. If he seems nervous, stands up and sniffs, or turns quickly and cocks his ears, the chances are good that he's reacting to the sound or smell of another bear. Before black bears will tolerate one another at close range, a hierarchy is established. Interaction like you're about to see is common with multiple bears at a bait. The 
staccato-like huffing sound you'll hear is often used in bear-to-bear -bear confrontations. <laughs> Slow motion reveals just how close that swat was. Within 10 days after setup, at least six bears were using this site. The grease pad makes a difference, and the barrel offers important advantages. Here we have a horizontal barrel bait. The beauty of using a horizontal 55 gallon drum such as we have here is that it shields your bait from rain. Many of the baits that we use don't do well when they're wet. These are donuts, and they turn to mush when they get wet. So when you have your bait enclosed in a 55 gallon drum, it really protects it from the weather. Probably the best thing about a barrel, I think, is that when you have a bear standing in front of it, you can tell how big he is because we know how big that barrel is. This barrel holds about 440 pounds of liquid. If you have a bear standing right here, and you can imagine him stuffed into that barrel, if he filled the barrel, that's a 400 pound bear. That's a big bear. If you have a 200 pound bear, then again, you can judge him against the size of this barrel. Really helps. It's also easy to position your bear when using a barrel. Here we have a barrel that only opens on one side. If we have a bear coming in and he's hitting this bait, he's going to stand right here, right in front of the barrel, right where Ralph needs him for that shot. When you're only 10 yards from a bear in a tree stand, stand technique is very important. Let me show you a couple of things that I pay real close attention to. Tree stand hunting and safety belt use go hand in hand. Spraying a cover scent on branches at stand level is good masking scent technique. Stand squeaks need to be identified and eliminated. Loose shards of bark that catch and grate on clothing should be removed from your backrest. In stand foot movement is amplified by tree stand. Foot noise is a major cause in lost shot opportunities. Even when responding to sound, head movement must be slow and smooth. If a bear catches you moving, you'll leave. If you're going to hunt from a sitting position, practice shooting from a sitting position. Tree stand hunters that sit move less than hunters that stand. Duplicate field conditions at home and practice on a life-size full-body bear target with no bullseye. Black bears have very... especially when they're at the bait. I've had a number of bears hear me when I removed an arrow from my quiver. Now here's the noise. And here's one that I put a little dab of Vaseline on to eliminate the noise. Ralph's wearing Brigade Quartermaster's ASAC gray camo. It's extremely effective at breaking up his silhouette. Ideally, cover at stand level should exist both above and behind the hunter when viewed from the bear's perspective. This bear is the second largest using the station, and he's a boar. A good sex clue for male bears is to watch for the penal teeth near the rear of the abdomen. It's most visible on this bear when he steps onto the smaller log.
will be no shot. Ralph gambles that the next bear will be larger. This bear is called free spot. The cylinder on the tree next to him is a homemade scent dispenser. For now, he responds only to bear and man scent. In this case, the largest bear is also the most cautious. He's been sighted before, but has never set foot in the clearing. Watch as he loses confidence and then misjudges the power of the current.
three spots on his chest when he came in? Yeah, i seen that. Uh, remember about three days ago, he was right across the creek there, and when he stood up, we could see them three dots. Well, you know, that's, uh, that's how we knew it was that big one. I saw him about 10 minutes before he came in, circling down the river. I saw him cross the river, and then it was a strong, good 10 minutes before he ever even come near the uh, train yeah. station. Yeah, he was spooky. Did you hear every little, every little sound? He'd jump up and look around. This guy is an old bear. He's been around a long time, and that's the kind you want to wait. You got to wait, and you know, and take your shot. And this is the this is the guy we've been looking for. It's a that good bear. About. Oh, <laughs> a lot of work. A lot yeah. of work. Yeah, that's good. But he was really spooky. Well, that was exciting. That's really look at that. Uh, one of the best hides we've seen. So he's he deep, don't. Huh? Yeah, he don't have no rubs. That's great. That'll be a nice bear. You drive me crazy. I never know when you're going to shoot. Well, I, I had to pull on him that one time, and then I had to let down. It, you know, I got to make sure it's the right shot there, so I had to draw twice. So. <laughs> I was watching him. I couldn't concentrate on what you were doing. I knew we were going to shoot him because, <laughs> yeah. man, he was, you know, he was the one we're looking for. <laughs> Well, the, the thing is, like when he gets around there, you know, only a little while he presents a shot, you know, and then if he doesn't turn just exactly right, well, I can't, you know, I can't take the shot till he's, you know, right in a position, and then, and then when he turns there, then I've got to be ready. Well, I know you waited because I don't think he lived 15 seconds past arrow impact. Yeah. I don't think he did. That's the fastest I ever saw a bear quit ever. <laughs> yeah, that was that was just about right for uh, for the place to hit them, you know, just about in the center of the up and down, and then just a little bit forward of center of the bear, and then going down in, and that's that's the exact, it's just about a perfect shot there. So that was great. Lungs and probably heart for him to quit that. Probably the top of the heart. heart yeah. yeah, that's great. It was a good shot, and, and uh, everything worked fine. <laughs> well, how big do you think he's going to be? Boy, I think he's a nice bear. It looks to me like he's going to make a six-foot bear. And, and how big do you think his head is going to be? You think we're going to he's going to make it? Oh yeah, <laughs> that there is an easy make. The Pope and Young easy make it. Yeah, I could see his head and his neck when he came in. I could see his head and his neck. You know, yeah. his head didn't have that skinny neck. We have no. a lot of those. We got. A lot of bears coming in on this bait, especially we had yeah. two at least coming in. Had that kind of a skinny neck, young looking bear. Yeah. Now, this is an old bear. He's got a big, big head, and it looks really nice. And but well, we'll just skin it out, and uh, and then we'll measure it there. It looks right. like it's going to do good. Yeah, I think we got one for the book. Let's back up here a couple of minutes and pick that shot apart. There might be something here you can learn to help you take your big bear. When we look back at this last shot you just watched, there's a few things to keep in mind, some things you can learn from this. First of all, Ralph was well concealed at the sand level. He's in a dense spruce tree, not easily spotted by the bear. Secondly, we have the cubby set up in such a way that the barrel is tipped over here. The bear has to stand right in front of the barrel, a good broadside shot for Ralph. Probably the most important thing happened early on, and that is when we, de we designed this site, when we chose this site to set up our bait. We did some scouting, and we know for a guaranteed fact that that cottonwood, that fallen cottonwood in the stream right behind me, is a crossing. It's a natural crossing. There are bear trails, kind of tunnels through the alders and through the devil's club on the other side that lead right up to that log and the scratches on the log. You can see where the bears have been clawing their way and moving across that log. It's a natural crossing. All the bears from that side of the creek have been moving through here. The creek right behind us is an important element because it's setting up some real nice babbling background noise, some cover noise. The fact that we have multiple bears working this bait is also important because when you have one bear here and he knows there are other bears walking around, he's always watching. Did you notice how the bear, he looks around a little bit? He's always watching for other bears. He's not watching for us. We have good lighting coming here. Late in the evening, we have perfect light. We can shoot late. Now, no one factor is going to be the deciding point between success and failure when you set up your bait station. But every one of the bait stations you set up, you need to take into consideration all these factors and try to incorporate as many of them as possible in your bait.
And then, at the close of the season, it's your responsibility to pack out everything you packed in. By respecting what is given to us, we can ensure that future generations can experience the special thrill of bow hunting hungry black bears. For us, it's been great bow hunting these hungry black bears the last couple of years. It's our intention to share with you proven bow hunting techniques that'll help make you a better bow hunter. As your technique improves, so will your success. But be careful not to equate bow hunting success only with the trophies you take. For me, real bow hunting success is the satisfaction and enjoyment I get in knowing that I'm pursuing a wild animal in his own habitat with a bow and arrow. For me, that's fair chase, one-on-one. -on -one. And remember, keep your bow hunting fun. Thank you.